Okay, here's a nice old headset that I've had since I was a kid. Uh, I ripped these up originally, uh, I remember as a kid, uh, to some uh, old um, old um, transistor radio and listened to them. They actually worked. Hopefully I didn't wreck them in the process of playing around with them um, as a kid. I haven't tested them since then. The one thing, uh, you know, I happened to find them in, the, in a box after I'd got the, uh, the 1921 uh, Westinghouse um, radio and I thought, well, if I still have these, these would be great to, um, you know, to restore and uh, use with that uh, that radio because it just totally period. And as you can see, they have a bunch of tape on them. I I, I got them with the tape and the baker lights broken and so forth. And uh, you know, the it's a simple little metal diaphragm and a coil. There's not really much to them. And of course the the bummer, of course, is uh, the Bakelite's all broken, and uh, so the thought is to 3D print some replacements. So that's kind of the next project here. The 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 thing about the 3D printing, of course, is that it it's a it's a, a kind of a digital process, and you just build up layers and layers of plastic, and uh, so the 3D printed part still won't look quite like Bakelite. The Bakelite is is a nice smooth surface. Um, and I'm, what I'm hoping though is I can model this in a, my CAD, my favorite CAD software, free CAD, in two pieces, and then glue them together, and uh, probably layers of paint or something, sand it and paint, make it look reasonably uh, approximate to uh, bake, the original bake light.
So, you know, uh, the idea is to get the threads to, to fit this guy, and it's taken a few test runs, but uh, this the, these thread in pretty well. Okay, so we got our 3D printed parts. I think they came out pretty good. They look, you know, reasonably close to, I mean, that ear cap, I think it looks reasonably close, if you ignore the fact that it's a very stepped process. And then the back part, uh, the threads are reasonably close, and the threads, you know, they, they take a little bit to kind of seat and get, you know, get the threads, that last little bit cut in, because it's not exactly a duplicate fit, and this is a, a digital process after all, and it's little layers. But uh, considering, so I get that to start, initially get that in there, and then let's get it squared up where the threads don't cross. It goes on pretty decently overall. It looks like I crossed the threads. The big thing is to get it to that to seat right the first time and get the old threads on the on the um, part here to kind of cut in to the 3D printed threads and get them to kind of clean up a little bit. And that's kind of the, the trick as to how to do that without the threads crossing. Okay, so next we're going to try and uh, put a, uh, a coating on these guys. I tried um, I tried painting, initially hoping that if I could just put on a, a thick enough layer of paint you wouldn't be able to tell that it's really a 3D printed part, but it just looks like a 3D printed part, or even kind of almost looks like a wood turning really, doesn't it? It just has too much texture in it to uh, look convincingly like a 3D printed part, so I'm going to take this guy here that still has the, um, the glue oozed out here, I've got to sand that down, and then what I'm going to try and do on both these guys is I'm going to use this, um, um, obviously no endorsement here, uh, I haven't ever tried this before myself, so this is a, be a learning, uh, learning experience for me, but it's some sort of, uh, some sort of, um, like a thick varnish or something like that, it's a really thick material, it's a two-part epoxy, I guess, and um, you mix the two uh, things together evenly. i got two old uh, cups here, and the, and, the, and the instructions are really, it's really quite an involved effort to, to do this thing, so I sure hope this works, because it's quite a, quite a bother. You have to, you have to put two even amounts of the hardener and uh, resin together, or the hardener and the resin, you take the, I believe it's a hardener, goes into the resin, and you got to mix that for six minutes. They, they insist six minutes of very, very light stirring so you don't put in air bubbles, and I guess it chemically heats up exothermic reaction. And then for some reason, you have to pour it into yet another container, and I'm kind of a cheapskate. I don't see any reason to need to measure that, so I think that I'm going to put about, about that much in there, and I'm hoping that will be sufficient for these two little guys. And then you got to mix for another six minutes. And if I had an infrared thermometer, which I ought to have, I mean, I'm a kind of techie guy, I really ought to have one. You can buy them cheap at Harbor Freight, maybe next I'll, I'll buy one. Uh, you're supposed to get to a certain temperature, or six minutes is probably going to work. And then you can start to pour that stuff on and very lightly spatula it around uh, with some sort of a rubber spatula. I'm a cheapskate again, so I've chopped up some old yogurt lids. They're very soft and pliable, I think they'll work fine. And I got some scrap plastic for the stirs. So I think I'm basically ready to go. I just gotta sand this guy down, make certain as always with these things, you always gotta be so dust free and then and my work environment, I can never seem to get the dust free part all that well. And then I guess you once you get it all on there, you'll have little bubbles. And the idea is that you wanna pop the bubbles with some sort of heat source. Um, in this case it's gonna be a cheap uh, heat gun or a blowtorch or maybe a hairdryer. And because this is PLA plastic, obviously I can't heat it very much to begin with in itself, so they're obviously expecting to do things like some uh, wood countertop or, or t table or something like that, so I'm going to have to be especially careful on making certain I don't overheat this, because this is a pretty low melting temperature plastic, that's why it's so fun to 3D print with it, because it's easy to, to print with, but you know, something over 200 degrees and it starts to get to its glass transition point and softens up and so forth. And that would obviously ruin the fine threads that we managed to print on these guys. So, next is sand this guy, 
blow them off really good and then try and goop up and mix and mix and mix and mix these guys and see how it goes. Okay, so this guy's sanded about as good as I can, I can get it. You can still see the steps and so forth. The 3D printing is a digital process and we're trying to make something that looks like it's very much in the analog world. So the next thing is I'll pour in resin, hardener, mix for a long time. Not sure if that's really of any interest on YouTube here, so I'll just go through this horrible mess and see how this goes. And I'll just come back with them. About ready to pour it on, I guess. Okay, so after uh, quite a bit of curing time, these guys finally cured. And as you can kind of see, they got some runs and so forth. I could never get them really quite right. So this epoxy idea is kind of challenging. To, uh, smooth this all out so I'm kind of wondering if maybe I'm overthinking this problem but by the way if you do do the epoxy method I, I saw these at um, I think Wendy's or something like that they're a lot smaller than the containers I was using a little more reasonable scale uh, for ketchup it might have been a little more reasonable scale but the next thought is I printed up some more of these guys I'm going to glue them together with my usual Gorilla Glue if you haven't tried that stuff before it uh, it kind of expands and uh, so you have to use a very thin film and it, uh, it's kind of water triggered so you have to put the, a little bit of water in here and glue this together but, but my thought is what I'm going to try and do is these of course have all these imperfections and this one initially I was trying to just paint and then sand and ha I was hand sanding it was quite tedious uh, and I was going to sand and fill and sand and fill uh, sand uh, fill with paint and sand until I got all those step lines out well, it dawned on me why not just put this on the lathe and uh, turn it? So I made this little um, arbor. These little guys will screw into. And I'll chuck this on the lathe. And what I'll do is I'll make a, a version of this for a 3 8 chuck for like a, a drill press or a, or a um, hand drill. But this is kind of optimized for a lathe. The thought is I'll um, take and um, turn these on the lathe a bit with the sandpaper and see if I can kind of even them up and if that's the case it might, it might be a, it'll be a lot easier to sand then in which case what I may just simply do is try my original idea of sanding these guys and putting multiple layers of paint and sanding sand and paint until I kind of fill it in with just little layers of paint and sanding those steps down that might be a lot more practical so anyhow uh, so I'll, I'll glue this guy up like you see it's kind of a a um, water-based kind of glue, and you have to be, you have to kind of get it moist, and it, it doesn't take a whole lot. It's a lot like super glue. In fact, it might even be just super glue on a thicker basis. And the big thing is to um, use very, very little. What I've, what I've discovered is every time I've done anything with this stuff, it expands a crazy amount. So even that might be too much. Okay, and we put those together as centered as I can. And I'm gonna take a big old weight and there we go. Wait for 30 minutes to an hour and see what that looks like. And then off we go to the lathe to sand these other guys. Okay, over at the lathe here, and uh, once again, this this guy, this uh, arbor is meant for the lathe. Um, I'll make some versions for the for like a drill press or a electric uh, hand drill. You could use it'd be a, probably a three eighths a chuck size. The the idea here is just to spin and sand it easily. I've covered my lathe with uh, plastic and some uh, newspaper just to. Mostly protect the bed. You, uh, I'm sure if you're familiar with precision machine tools, you definitely don't want abrasive you know, getting on your uh, on your lathe bed. So the idea here is just to sand this guy with the ever increasing uh, layers of uh, sandpaper. In this case, I want to actually spin it this way. And, uh, go at it. It's better to have it pulling away a little bit. This is a pretty aggressive sandpaper, and obviously in this case, 
be very careful around the, uh, the truck if you're uh, using a wave. So that's why they're kind of keeping you know, get away from this. It's the sand paper. Maybe you're too aggressive. Mine's really taking it off. I might have to go to the lighter. Lighter sandpaper. It's uh, a lot softer than I would have thought. in the plastic itself. Yeah, that's actually pretty good actually, I think. I can't really say for sure I'm actually into the plastic or if I'm into the, uh, only into the, the two-part epoxy. Seems like that two-part epoxy's come off pretty fast. But if, the, if, if indeed it's still epoxy, I, I don't seem to see the steps of the Line of plastic, so maybe I'm doing okay here. Uh, I think maybe a couple layers of paint. I, I'm really beginning to think that two part epoxy is probably more trouble than it's worth. And if it, you know, if I have to sand so much that I'm starting to get to the initial outer perimeter layers of plastic, I'll just have to uh, print another one with, with more layers than I have. I usually only do like two, two perimeter layers. I try and keep my models pretty minimal. I think I'm to the point where on this one I could probably just go ahead and paint it, put a layer of paint on it. I think that the back side needs a little touch up too. Um, unfortunately, the way I made this call, it maybe it'll, there might be a few too many layers of threads. I might want to thin them down a little bit so I can get to the back a little bit easier. I was a little reluctant to, uh, you know, just encourage too much reaching in from the back because obviously the more you do that, the more you risk hitting. Uh, the, um, the chuck with your hand. Maybe I can use some more aggressive sandpaper for that side initially. Get these high spot points down. These are grips that ran from the plastic. You know, the plastic, I'd, I'd wait for the stuff to harden. And it never, it, it, took, it took a long time for it to harden. I may still not mix it right. And um, you'd kind of have to roll it around all the time to kind of see where it was running and dripping towards and roll them around and kind of go back and forth waiting for them to cure up enough. And after a point you just pretty much had to give up for the day. So it's kind of one of those learning curve things. Luckily these things are real easy to print anymore now that I've figured out the, uh, the magic of getting the threads to print nicely. That was kind of a challenge because the threads on uh, for this design really are kind of on the hairy edge of what you can do in a practical manner with 3D printing filament. I have toyed with the idea of buying a uh, UV curable, um, you know, those curable liquid uh, 3D printers, but the printing materi material is so kind of nasty, messy stuff. It's, it's kind of nasty, messy stuff, just like the stuff I poured on these guys. Only, uh, only worse because you um, get that stuff on your skin and you could develop a uh, instant allergy to it. It's really quite a bad stuff to actually you know, interact with until it's cured. I guess once it's cured it's pretty good. And then I still got to figure out how to clean out the stuff that's actually in the hole here. Probably should figure that out before I paint. Okay, so there's still a bit of a run on this side. And it'll obviously take some, a couple 
whole layer to get that. All right. I think I am really just working with the epoxy here. I don't think I'm actually hitting the, the print threads yet. The print uh, layers, I should say. And then there were a couple low spots. It looks like I still had some bubbles. Let's see a low spot here. Still have some two double sided tape on the back side here. I was using to attach these guys to uh, some pieces of bronze or brass bar stock I used as stands. They worked pretty well to. Uh, that way it, they'd act as a handle and I wouldn't have to touch the uh, parts themselves and I'll, I'll do that again, I'll clean them up and when I go out to the garage to paint these guys I'll, uh, I'll tape them up again so it works fairly, fairly well so we can get in there with some of my sanding paper maybe this epoxy is good, I don't know we'll Yet another day, and uh, quite a few more, uh, probably what, three more sprains later, and I think I'm getting really to the point where, you know, I'll, I'll give it one more little sanding, just to, just to get the little tiniest little flaws out, uh, with the very lightest, uh, probably just the green pad. I might even try some steel wool if I have some, and, uh, and then I'll give them a couple more coats of black paint, and then uh, I think I have some... Uh, Oh, clear lacquer, shellac, um, you know, some sort of clear vinyl, uh, some sort of clear coat stuff. I'm sure I have something around here. Give that a coat so that the, it's a little more, I'm hoping it'll be a bit more durable than just the paint. And uh, I think these will work. I think these are looking pretty nice. <laughs> You know, is it um, just slightly kind of buffed like that? It has that more of a dull, um, uh, bakelite look that you know you're probably familiar with with uh, bakelite that's been old and kind of just had a chance to oxidize and get kind of a tarnish, as it were. From what I understand bakelite when it's new is actually can be quite uh, shiny and lustrous for you know at least classic black bakelite, and uh, I've seen people do cleaning and, and polishing, buffing up restoration uh, efforts on YouTube with uh, Bakelite and you can make it look really pretty and I'm hoping on this one uh, radio cabinet I have that's made out of Bakelite I can do that so I'll probably still go ahead and um, put a clear coat on these guys and it'll make it shinier than what you would might classically expect Bakelite to be you know if you're used to Bakelite being kind of dull instead of shiny like this but I, I think I'll go with shiny I guess you can probably always just uh, buff them. You could even take the clear coat. I think probably buff it a little bit and take some of that shine out. I suppose too. But it's probably more um, durable than just the paint by itself. I'm guessing. Here's the, the finished product, the uh, fake Bakelite uh, parts. I'd say overall they came out pretty good. They're, uh, you know, at first glance, if you don't look at them too closely, you w I don't think you'd really know the difference. Um, I did ultimately go with a matte 
clear coat finish, just a very light um, coating on there. Maybe I could put one or two more coatings on. I think overall they look, you know, for a first attempt, I think overall they look pretty good. If I ever do this again, hopefully I'll, I'll be able to do a better job. And, you know, minus uh, decades worth of earwax, it, uh, it, I'd say they look fairly close. I mean, obviously I didn't match them exactly alike because they, uh, I had to make mine out of two pieces. But, you know, it looks pretty good. I think overall they look sufficiently convincing that you wouldn't necessarily know that that it is not big like. And uh, I think it looks, you know, I think it looks pretty good. You know, this one isn't even the original uh, cap. This guy was, is, um, from some other manufacturer, it looks like they, they had to tape this one on. It's not even the right size thread. Let's see if I can get this guy off. Even very old tape. It's really just coming apart. Wow. <coughs> Still got to obviously work with the diaphragms. They're pretty rusty. I'm not sure what happened to them. I didn't. I'm gonna say these did work when I was a kid. So uh, I know there's some permanent magnets in here. I got to check the continuity. Uh, details there obviously, but at least from an aesthetic standpoint. Wow, look at all that dust. Um, tape. I don't think this thread's on this. It's nice. On this side. It's going to go on. Got years of tape goop and threads here. Go on there. there we go. Not too bad. So, Minus some very old tape, just you know, I don't think you'd uh, you'd know that those are not big alike. I obviously got to clean these guys up and so forth, but yeah, the overall came out pretty good. So plan is to put that uh, the files on Fingerverse, and um, uh, maybe I'll do an episode on actually getting these guys going. I didn't realize they were so rusty. I'm not sure what happened to them. Maybe they're always that way, and just I'd never taken them apart. Um, I guess the thing to, to realize is that getting these guys to work on the 3D printer is kind of challenging. The, uh, the threads are just borderline being able to be 3D printed. And the trick it seems to be is I, I think the plastic has to be pretty fresh plastic. Uh, what's interesting is these guys I had printed, boy, I still got a lot of dust on there. Um, I, I printed originally and then had recalibrated the printer once I realized I hadn't calibrated it so and I had to uh, make some minor adjustments adjust, adjustments to the file and these had printed out very nicely overall comparatively speaking and I wasn't able to quite get them to print as nicely this one's probably the best and uh, it seems to be the big trick is um, really high fan speed much higher than you probably would normally maybe slightly higher uh, temperatures and this is PLA by the way um, probably the easiest stuff to print with uh, higher higher cooling fan, maybe slightly higher temperature, much lower feed rates, um, and then probably fresher plastic. I mean, this this is the same plastic. This is probably when it was the plastic was new, and this is after it's been you know exposed to air for you know, probably close to a year now. I think when I finally got back to working on this project again, so the plastic didn't want to print as well, or at least that's the theory. I did grab some other plastic, which I think is not as old but still pretty old and even even the ones that did print nicely you still have to get a little bit of the strings out but you still wind up with pretty decent threads but it seems to be the biggest trick is and, and you know once you get it dialed in these these were also I think done earlier uh, they do print out pretty decently the threads so it can be done it's just it's a little more challenging so just be kind of aware that it's on the hairy edge of being able to 3D print and if you can uh, Maybe have a 3D printing service that does the UV cured plastic uh, stuff. That might be the way to go. Uh, these ultimately were, did, I did use that two part epoxy, quite a few um, steps of sanding and, and painting with that, um, sanding with that um, arbor I made and then painting. But I think overall it came out pretty good. I think they're fairly convincing. And it certainly re recovers these, these uh, headsets uh, aesthetically. And so I'll put on Thingiverse the files for the for the uh, ear sets and for the uh, arbors. And um, I guess good luck with making your own headsets uh, 
look decent again if you got hopelessly broken, you know, um, Bakelite. So, anyhow, hope you enjoyed it and thanks for watching.